Welcome back to another UNC basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated, I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me, as he always does, when we talk Carolina basketball recruiting, our director of basketball recruiting, Mr. David Sisk. And David, this is the first podcast I've ever done in my life with somebody who's COVID positive. You uh, found out last week you're positive. So uh, we're going to have to you know be careful here because you got got COVID don't want to get through the zoom here and get me uh uh sick well I, that's one thing that scares me I'm, I'm afraid I might get it to you but everybody in my house you know you were talking about my wife just walked by and she had it and uh I got it from her good news she goes off tonight she's out of quarantine tonight and and I'm uh stuck with it till Thursday night at midnight and then hopefully yeah. we'll both be out of the woods well, I'm glad both of you are doing well with it, and I'm uh, looking forward to Thursday at midnight. You're getting through it, and, and you're good to go after that. Even even wearing the Yankee hat, I'm overlooking the Yankee hat. I I've got, put my over you know this. Here. I've I've had a different hat on. I think every I podcast we've done, I've had, I'd like to keep you on. But I think it's been all ALA, so I like to keep you on your uh, toes. Well, there you go. I got to send you an Orioles one. So you can wear that. <laughs> yeah, do you do it? I'll wear it. <laughs> All right, let's dive into basketball recruiting. Signing day's coming up here in a week. Uh, Carolina's got two kids that are going to sign, Dodger Styles and DeMarco Dunn. But you, you, we ran a piece Monday morning that you wrote, really good piece about, hey, you know, don't hit the panic button, everybody. They're going to get these two guys now, and there's still options down the road in the spring, and certainly one of their main targets is, is probably not going to announce until the spring as well. Basically, what – we're trying to get across to people. What you were trying to get across to people is don't panic. And there is a lot of panic in the fan base thinking that this is it. These are the only guys we're always going to get. You know, what do they do if a bunch of dudes leave? It's just kind of take it from there. I think there's so many ways we can go, but I think you have to lay the foundation first. I think people see what Duke does recruiting, maybe what Kentucky does recruiting, and, and Coach Williams, Roy Williams, his – Recruiting philosophy, in my opinion, is totally different because he won a national championship and got to two national championship games here recently with no one and duns. And Duke, Kentucky, they're kind of going that route. So I think there's more pressure on programs like that to land these guys than there is North Carolina because I don't think Roy puts all his chips in to try to land a top five guy that's going to be there one year. Uh, you and I have had conversations, even with Cole Anthony here last year, that all the circus that went on with that was really not something maybe he was the most comfortable with the whole time. So uh, I think, number one, you have to look at how they build the program. Roy's not as much into one and duns. Number two, I think if you take a look at his roster, even though we don't know what's coming back for the 2020 for the 21-22 season, um, this has got a chance. It's got a chance to be a good team. I think it got a chance to be good next year. But really deep, if 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 a lot come back, a really deep, talented team uh, that is that way in the perimeter. It's that way in the front court. So if I'm Roy, I'm I'm definitely not panicking. He's and, and he's not. He knows better than any of us. And. I guess my advice to North Carolina fans would be there's no need to do it because he's going to have a really good program in 21-22, a really good team. And anything that he adds to that really is just cherry on top. But you've got to understand in the whole concept of running his program and what is the North Carolina program, how he wants to go about it, and what type of players he wants to add to his roster. In his three titles at Carolina, 05 and 2017, had a one-and-done guy, but neither one of them started. Marvin Williams came off the bench, played a big role in that team, but still came off the bench. And Tony Bradley played less of a role in 17. In fact, didn't really do a whole lot in the Final Four. So he, I think we did a podcast a few weeks ago, and you said, you know, coaches tell you you want to win national championships, you've got to get old. Usually you have to get old. And I think that – what you see with Roy is the layering factor where you can get old but still bring in one or two of those one-and-done type kids a year. So we're not going to really get into styles and done here. We are, uh, we've are we talked about them a lot. Everybody's really familiar with them. They're going to go ahead and sign their names next week. Let's talk about Hunter Salas for a minute, and then we'll just kind of look ahead to the spring 
and go back on what you just said. Sort of Can I add one question. thing before we get to Hunter while well, it's on my mind? Let me add one thing. Yeah. I think if you look at, at Twitter and you look at the Carolina team at their Twitter feed and you look at the Kentucky program, their Twitter feed, and if you just look at what's put in, uh, Kentucky was talking about their players, even when the NBA playoff was going on, their ex-players in the playoffs, where Kentucky, or North Carolina rather, was all pictures from practice, uh, from workouts. And I think that said a whole lot right there about what Roy and his belief system is, that we're not was worried about, stuff outside the program it's just our players that we've got in here right now and so we're not worried about necessarily bells and whistles for recruiting we're focusing on the players we've got right now for this year's team and that's totally our focus it, chemistry is important every program i've ever covered football basketball whatever even when i covered the nhl and hockey chemistry is very important but um there are some programs, some franchises, organizations, where it's even more important. And chemistry is one of the intangibles at UNC's program. I'm not saying it's not at Kentucky's, but I think having kids know what they're getting into, so when they get there, there's not much culture shock, is a big part of recruit Roy's recruiting. So when people say, well, why didn't you go after this guy? Why didn't you go after that guy? Sometimes it's just a matter of fit. It doesn't mean that the kids aren't, aren't good kids. It's just a matter of who fits in that particular type of culture and that does kind of play into what we're talking about right now with respect to going into the spring and a guy like Hunter Salas who by the way is very interested in Kentucky and very interested in North Carolina so kind of what is the latest with him if there is a latest and what are you kind of projecting out as far as when he's probably ultimately going to make a decision kind of what I've, I've thought all along and there was some buzz maybe a month ago or so that he might uh come out for early signing period he might make his decision and we've said all along there has been a rift uh and not a bad rift i don't mean a disagreement but there's been a difference of opinion among the family members of uh, uh does he does he prolong this recruitment and go into the spring does he get it done with uh, and I, I think he's one that's maybe kind of tired of the recruiting process, but he still wants to take his official visits. So his official visits have to come in the spring. And in doing so, uh, it, it looks like he's won out on that one. And he wants us to really push this thing past early signing period. He said recently that he feels like he's going to uh, probably cut his list in the next few weeks. Well, there's no way he can cut his list here. It's November the 2nd. I think early signing period starts in nine days. There's no way he could trim his list, even if he did it in the next five minutes and then make a decision. I just don't see that happening. I think officials are really important to him. And You've seen a lot, not only with rivals, but with other companies where there have been predictions by national analysts who have kind of leaned that way and went ahead and make a prediction for a team anyway. I just would not feel comfortable doing that because if a kid's telling me, hey, I'll probably wait to March and, or April because I really want to take visits, it just doesn't make sense to me that you would go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to make a prediction for this team. It tells me that when he visits North Carolina and Kentucky and Creighton and Iowa State and Kansas probably going to be the five, I would guess, they've all got a chance to put their best foot forward. But I think that bodes well for North Carolina because – I don't know that they would have been the choice had he done it this fall, but uh, I think it gives them a lot better chance here as it goes into the spring. And I would think a wide open recruitment, which they're probably, in my opinion, in the top three. I would say North Carolina, Kentucky, Creighton would be anybody's ballgame. What's interesting is that when Hunter Salas first landed squarely on our radar, when we started covering him and writing about him and doing podcasts about him. And, and this was even before you came on board here, THI. At the time, it was understood he wanted to take official visits. So uh, th the thought was, well, maybe if they open things up, you know, toward the end of September, maybe he could take one in the fall. Well, then we find out that the dead period is extended to December 31st. And now you and I have talked about this a little bit here recently. You know, how much further will the dead period be extended? And at what point? is Hunter Salas is going to have to say, look, 
you know, this isn't working into my favor as far as being able to go see places I want to see. It's not just doing what Trey Kaufman did, check out the campus and drive by the arena on the outside. You know, this kid wants to have the officials so he can see the, the absolute innards of a program, spend more time around Roy Williams. He's going to want to meet in person the guy that's going to coach him. So at what point does a guy like Hunter Sellis say, look, this is, I'm not going to be able to do this. So the closer to home places that he's actually been to uh, might end up winning out. Yeah, that's a great point. But uh, and now it looks like that the dead period may go to the Final Four. You yeah. know, and it won't extend that long. So, but even so, um, you know, maybe you have the opportunity to do it in April, and a lot of kids uh, do it at that time. You know, so maybe there's that opportunity. But I wonder too. I know Chet Holmgren. When I was still working with a Minnesota site, probably a couple of weeks before I came on work here, I uh, spoke with Chet and said, Chet, you know, are you, are you going to do it early? You're going to wait till spring? And he said, if you're a top five, top ten player, it makes no sense to do it now. He said, wait and see what you have in the spring. Who has what players coming back? What the different programs look like? Take all that into consideration. Now, Chet's more probably the G League prospect. I don't think Hunter's a G League prospect, so there's a little bit of difference. And I don't know if, if, if Hunter's into looking at the rosters. He may be. So there may be more to consider than a visit. Well, that, that kind of raises my next question, and, and you sort of just answered a little bit. Carolina has six freshmen. We, we talked earlier in this podcast, and you know, I've talked – a lot before that all six could be back as sophomores. Yeah. And, and, and if well, anybody well, does I, go, I think five, I, I don't think yeah. Caleb Love comes back, but I, yeah, think I was going to say, if anybody five. does go, it's probably Caleb Love. So is Hunter maybe looking at the K, K, uh, Caleb Love, RJ Davis makeup, you know, even Anthony Harris, depending on how he factors in. Cause you know, that's a lot of bodies back there in the backcourt and DeMarco Dunn's going to be in. I mean, how but much do you think that, that might factor? A guy as good as him, uh, one thing I've learned from recruiting guys of these caliber, uh, they don't think that there's anybody there that's going to beat them out. Now, you said, well, you said, well, a while ago, you said they wanted to see what the rosters look like. I think what they want to kind of look like with the rosters is, okay, what's around them? You know, do I have a scoring piece? Do I have a big man? How good are we going to be? You know, do I want to? I don't want to go to this school that's or this program that's not going to be that good when I could go here and we could be really good. That's what I meant more by it. Yeah. But um, I, like someone told me, these guys are alphas, every one of them like that, and they don't ever think that there's a player on the roster that can beat them out. So, I, and I wouldn't think that. And this is no knock on R.J. Davis or some of those others, but you can look where they're ranked and you look where Hunter's ranked. And one thing about Hunter, he can play on the ball or off the ball. So he could come and play a two, he could play a point, he could play a combo. So um, I don't know that necessarily what comes back is going to impact him as far as whether he thinks he's going to get playing time or he's going to sit on the bench. So to what you just said, the fact that there's a good chance Carolina's going to have a lot of depth up front and yeah. they're going to have a lot of guys that can grab rebounds and they can get those defensive boards and get out and run and get it to guards that push it up the court. That might be a bigger factor than whoever's on the perimeter. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think it's pieces around them. Like I say, you just – he probably is a one and done, you know, and it's really the the – probably the player right now that has the opportunity out of this class. If you have one and one and done player comes in each class, that doesn't necessarily make you a one and done program. You know, you're not building around those type of players. So let's say this year it's Caleb Love. Next year, let's say Hunter Salas. Well, that's two out of nine, you know. So um, so I don't think that gives North Carolina that type of talent. But I, I do think he wants to see, like you say, how good can this team be? Well, hey, if I go there, 
look, they've got they got Dayron Sharp back, or they got Walker Kessler back, and they got this player on the wing. They got Puff Johnson. They, you know, we've got a chance to be. I could go here. We we could win the whole thing. We could be a Final Four threat. We can win the ACC. So I, to me, that would be something that would be appealing. And also looking at a possible spring decision for maybe somebody else, because maybe Hunter can't make any visits. He ends up staying close to home, or maybe he. He goes to Kentucky. I know a lot of people have been saying, hey, Kentucky maybe took a lead in, in the eyes of some. Roy has shown an ability throughout time that he can get in with a kid late and still win them. Yeah. So there, there are some 21s out there that as Carolina gets into to its season and Roy sees, okay, these guys, this is what these guys are doing, and the scouts get a chance to finally see some of these guys, you start getting an idea – Okay, maybe Caleb Love is the only guy that goes. So that's you know where North Carolina, that's where North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky, and Kansas are alike. Those four that they can, yeah, they can go in late, and they've got the brand behind them. That's the way. That's my terminology. Roy Williams has got the brand, and uh, yeah, and and it can make all the difference in the world. You know, uh, you know, covering Walker Kessler, uh, you know. Uh, when I did some work with the Vanderbilt side, I went and watched him play in Nashville. And, you know, you talked about some schools, the Georgia and the Auburns and North Carolina really wasn't one you mentioned early on. And then, you know, they come in and, and, and take them out right out from under the nose of some good programs. So that's one advantage yeah, that, that they can have is Roy could come in in the spring last minute and, and have a shot at anybody in the country. Yeah, I mean, look at Kerwin Walton. They were involved last fall. Kind of yeah. backed off, didn't yeah. happen. And then he got reinvolved again in the spring and very quickly were able to get him. Yeah, yeah. And it was, and you've got to remember too, that was a program that Kansas and Arizona and some of the others, uh, Ohio State, a lot of really good teams in the Big Ten. So it wasn't like they beat out Drake and, 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 and Northern Iowa or, or somebody like that for him. I mean, they went, they came in late and went to head to head with, programs that I would consider, you know, Kansas, uh, uh, we know what they are. Arizona's a top 10 or 12 program. You know, easily some top 15 to 20 programs, quite a few of them, if they come in and got him. Before we close out this podcast, if the dead period is extended to the Final Four, and it really seems like that's going to be the case, when you talk to people, uh, you know, one of the things that the Blue Bloods, the Kansases and Carolinas, the Dukes, the, Car- uh, the, the Can- uh, Kentuckys, they really excel when they're able to bring kids in for a game and let them soak in the atmosphere, soak yeah. in the experience. So many other schools, they can try, but they can't do that. They can't offer that. How might recruiting for programs like that, and certainly Carolina, since we cover Carolina, be affected this season if they can't have anybody in to the Dean Dome to see them play because there's going to be a whole host of dudes in the class of 22 that you would think would have a few opportunities to see a game in the Dean Dome, to, to see Roy up close. He's so good up close with these kids, bring their families in there and just kind of soak all that in. How is that going to affect a UNC not having that, be able to give that experience to a lot of these kids? Not as much as you might think, in my opinion. Uh, and I base that on two things. Well, I would think if you're Hunter Salas, Creighton and Iowa State and places like that can have a pretty good home court experience too. You know, there's not a lot to do in Ames, Iowa. They're going to have rowdy crowds. And uh, the other thing, though, I know this. I'll go back to my experiences. When I coached AAU, and people have heard me talk about this before, but we played the Bob Gibbons Invitational. And one thing that you were promised – originally started out over at Lenore Ryan in that area. And then he worked his way over where it was in triangle. So we played in Reynolds, we played in Cameron, we played in Carmichael, but every team was promised uh, games in the Dean Dome. So when you go to the Dean Dome, our kids knew, and we were all in Tennessee, our kids knew that was a special place. So when you came to Chapel Hill and you saw the Dean Smith Center and they took the tours through and they went through the locker rooms and they did all that, 
it's totally different. You know, we went a lot of different places and played. We went to University of Arkansas. We went to Purdue. Uh, we went to, you know, a lot of uh, huge deals. But at that time, you go back to the 90s, if you could go there, you know, if you could go to Cameron Indoor, Assembly Hall, that time at Indiana, some of those places were special. You know, and I never will forget, you know, I've got my team with me. I was coaching a 16-year-old team. So I've got boys in between their sophomore and junior years of high school. So we're out in the hallway, and we're going to take an elevator down to the bottom to where we can go to the floor. Well, the elevator door opens up, and it's Rashid Wallace and Jerry Stackhouse and Vince Carter get off the elevator, and they take a left. Well, you can guess what happened. I lost my whole team. I get on the elevator, and I look, and there's nobody with me. My whole team was, it was Pied Pipers down the hallway with me. So North Carolina, here's what I'm saying, they have that to offer. They did not have to have a game going on against North Carolina State to, to take all that in. And you've heard people say, you've heard recruits say, when you come to Chapel Hill, even if it's an April visit, a May visit, it, it's got a different feel to it. It does, no doubt about that. He's David Sisk. Fantastic stuff, my friend. I hope you feel better. I'm looking forward to Thursday night at midnight when you get the uh, the all clear signal. All right. And then uh, we'll do another show. You won't have any danger of catching anything from me. Yeah, I'll, I won't have to wear my mask. I forgot about wearing right, it from okay. the show. A mask would probably help us. but That would probably be the best thing for a video if you and I had masks on. Yeah, I don't get terrified looks from people in stores right now because I wear that big Orioles mask. So. <laughs> when I take it off, people are like, whoa. <laughs> all right, he's David Sisk. I'm Andrew Jones. You've been watching another UNC basketball recruiting podcast. Make sure if you like it, hit the like, share it with your Carolina fans, and let them know that we're always talking about UNC football and basketball and recruiting right here on TarHillIllustrated.com and our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated. Thanks for stopping by.